Today we'll be looking at making and installing the Mass Tabernacle, paying special attention to the hinge for that piece. Now, of the hundreds of parts one has to make for this model, I have to confess, I gave this piece only enough thought to get it done and to have it look reasonably like the real thing. In truth, I was never satisfied with the result. And over the course of building some 50 plus whale boats, did I ever change it? No. As much as this series has been a learning process for you out there in YouTube land, for me, it's been an amazing and unexpected journey of re-examination and evolution of method, technique, and thinking about this thing we do. Now, when I started this project, I called it an in-depth look for the model builder. Well, boys and girls, put on your floaties, because today we're going to the deep end of the pool. There's nothing special about this piece, the tabernacle. It's literally just a hunk of wood with some chamfered edges and a hole in it. But as always, you have details to watch for and options. For the tabernacle itself, I'm using boxwood. And just an aside here, whenever I say I use boxwood, you can easily substitute maple, cherry, or even poplar which is easier to find than anything else, really. Piece is made directly from the plans, and there's a detail visible in this photo of one of Charles W. Morgan's new whaleboats that's worth noting. Now, the tabernacle stands proud of the surface of the thwart by about three-eighths or maybe a half inch. And the reason for this is easy to see. That height difference allows for the two parts of the hinge to actually connect and then work. The other thing that one notices is that the tabernacle looks like it's nested into the thwart. So it's hard to tell from the photo, but does this mean that the tabernacle has a rabbit cut into its aft side to allow it to fit this way? Or does it mean that a part of the thwart has been cut away to allow the tabernacle to sit into it? As you can see, I chose to cut the piece into the thwart, and I won't waste time explaining my decision here. If you really want to know, leave a comment below, and I'll be happy to bore you to tears with my reasoning. This way it doesn't slow down the video too much. Now the shape can be either the radius piece that you see in the photos and on the plans, or the chamfered piece that you see here. And I've seen both on beetle boats, so it's really builder's choice. Once the part is made, I gave it a couple of coats of paint and installed it. Next comes a detail I've never been satisfied with on my models. That's the hinge. In the past, I've made the hinge like this. I start by using a drill bit as a mandrel, and it's the actual size of the mast at the tabernacle itself. Next, I bend a piece of 28 or 26 gauge wire around it and make it into a U form. It goes over to the anvil and I hammer it flat. Looks like this when it's done. Now I cut off most of the excess to make it easier to deal with. Then I use my homemade eye bolt pliers and I put a small loop at the end of each leg of the U shape. The straps for the hinge are just made from hammered wire and a loop is formed in the end of those pieces as well. Looks about like that when you're done. Then the parts are glued together and then a straight piece of wire is put through both loops and that acts as the hinge pin. 
Now, while this method produces acceptable results, the visual effectiveness is based solely on the builder's ability to hammer the stock flat to a consistent width. Not as easy, for me anyhow, as you might think. And there was always something niggling me about the overall look of the finished part. It was just not right. Too weeny looking, I think. Underscale and not true to the actual part. So, continuing my quest of reevaluating my methods, I decided to find a better way. And I think I did. It does involve a piece of special purpose equipment not every model builder has, but there is a workaround for that. So stick with me. We'll go through the way I did it first, and then I'll give you the alternatives. The new process looks like this. The mast hinge, or strap as it's referred to on the plans, is made from bronze, a quarter inch thick and an inch and a half wide. For my boat, I start with a piece of copper wire about 15 or 16 thousandths. And I straighten it out by putting one end in a vise and grabbing the other end with a pair of pliers and pulling it with a steady pressure. And you'll actually see my hands moving backwards in this video. When it does, you're done. Next comes that special tool I mentioned. It's called a rolling mill and it's used to flatten stock. In this case, making the round stock flatter and thus wider. Now I run the copper wire through the mill two, three times until I get the width I'm looking for. Now a small caution here, each time you run the stock through the mill, it becomes a bit more work hardened. So try and keep your passes through the mill down to a minimum. Otherwise, you may have to anneal it to make it workable again. So once the stock looks the way I want it, I use a drill bit as a mandrel again. And this is, again, the actual size of the mast at the tabernacle. I don't find it necessary to make it any larger. The forming process will actually make the mast strap a little larger, and you'll see that happen. Now, when bending it around the mandrel, the stock will want to curl up on the inside of the radius. This is not something you really want. You'll always have some small amount of it, but you should try and keep it to a minimum. In this example, you can see that I do have a little bit of a curl, and this little bit is easily eliminated with a few taps from the hammer. Now, bending the part by hand will give it a slightly bowed appearance and the legs of the U will not be straight. I corrected this by putting the part in a vise and slowly closing down on it until the legs were where they should be. And remember, I'm only going to be using a very small section of the piece, so don't spend a lot of time agonizing over trying to get the entire length of the legs straight. And you may have noticed that I was also using the mandrel just to check that I haven't squeezed it closed a bit too much. Just for neatness sake, I sanded out the bulk of the scratches. Nothing complicated here, just progressively finer grits. And I'm not bothering to remove all the scratches, just the most obvious ones. After that, I cut in the tabs for the hinge, and I just used a file for this. I only needed to remove about half the width of the strap, so it doesn't take long at all. And that's the tabernacle section done. Making the two straps is next, and I made these from brass flat stock, a 32nd of an inch thick by a 16th of an inch wide. I reduced the stock to about half its thickness for about two-thirds of its length and left just enough to form the barrel of the hinge. And just a reminder and an explanation here. The reminder, I always work oversized and work down to my final numbers. 
I like having wiggle room. Much less frustrating that way. And the explanation? You won't actually see me finish the shaping and fitting of the hinge because my camera had automatically shut off when the memory card filled up. I didn't realize that and just went on blissful and oblivious to my digital surroundings. So, what you would have seen me do is using a jeweler saw, I cut a slot in the barrel section and then you would have seen me widening that slot with a piece of sandpaper so that it would fit the tabs from the first part of the hinge. And once I did that, the parts were all buffed with an abrasive wheel, rinsed in alcohol, and then blackened with brass black from Birchwood Casey. A detail that I chose to omit, but you may want to include, is the appearance of the screws used in the installation of the hinge. On the real boat, these 10 screws would have been countersunk and would have been more or less flush with the surface of the hinge. Now I'm going to call this one another builder's choice. I haven't indicated any other fastenings on my model, so I really don't feel compelled to do so here. And while we're talking about builder's choice, the chronically observant among you will notice that the edges of the rounded part of the strap have a decorative bevel on them, inside and out. And then at about two inches from the end, it terminates in a nice square edge. And it's very nice looking, almost yacht-like. This is the main reason you won't see that on my model. This is a detail, again, of one of Charles W. Morgan's new boats. You've seen this boat many times in this series, and no doubt you'll see it many more times. This particular detail is a good example of why we as model builders in search of an historical accuracy have to be careful when using a reproduction of an historical artifact as a reference. We have to consider the context in which it was built. The people who built this boat knew exactly how it was going to be used. It would be seen literally by millions of people and it's clear that a great deal of pride and attention to detail went into its construction. Now, for the next couple of statements, I'm going to be entering the conjecture zone. Specifically, I'm going to be making two very bold assumptions that, as of this video, I haven't been able to substantiate, but do seem like logical conclusions based on what I have been able to learn. As always, you are invited to proffer alternatives in the comments. In Willits Ansel's book, he makes the assumption that because Charles Beadle knew that the boat that he was building for the Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia, was going directly to the museum, it would never be used as a working boat, he took extra care during the process. Ansel notes that the lines are a bit finer and the fit and finish in some areas is better than in most working boats. After all, if this was going to be the last whale boat to bear the Beetle name, it should look as good as it could be. And from where I stand, that's a reasonable assumption on Ansel's part and an appropriate attitude for a builder like Charles Beetle with a lifetime's experience in building boats that people would risk their lives using. So history may be repeating itself here with these boats. As I said before, the builders knew where the boats were going and how they would be used. Who wouldn't put their best foot forward when so many would be scrutinizing the shoe? During the second half of the 19th century, whaling was still a going, although declining concern. Boat shops in the whaling hubs were still turning out large numbers of boats to fill the need. And these boats had to be made efficiently and 
affordable to an industry with steadily narrowing profit margins. Now, if for a moment we could assume the role of a legendarily thrifty New England whaling ship owner, or captain for that matter, how would we feel about paying for someone to make a beautifully crafted fitting out of very expensive bronze for a working boat that would, in all likelihood, be in pieces on the ocean floor within one or two years. I'm willing to bet you'd be telling that boat builder to make that piece out of cast or wrought iron. That'll be just fine. But the moral to all these musings, just because you see it in a museum, don't blindly accept it as fact. Ask me how I know. So where was I? Oh yeah, the assembly gets glued into place. I'm gonna start with the Orlock pads. These are pretty low tech and straightforward. The plan I'm working from calls for them to be 16 inches long by two and a half inches wide by an inch and three eighths tall. The flat section in the middle is four inches and there is a hole in the center for the orlock shaft. That's about it. Oh, I almost forgot. There is a bevel on each of the sloping edges. I found that working at smaller scales like this, including this small detail, resulted in the pad looking more like it was sanded too much rather than having a nice crisp edge chamfer. It didn't look all that good on the real boats either. Just saying. I'm sure there are people out there with skill levels higher than mine that could carry this detail off successfully, but for me, this was a point of diminishing returns. From the aft edge of the thwart they serve, each of the pads is placed 12 and a quarter inches to the center of the orlock pad. There are three to starboard and two to port. Now for these parts, I'm using holly and I've made a blank 62 thousandths wide by 43 thousandths tall. I mark out the length, the four inch flat spot in the middle, and then the hole for with orlock shaft. I make a saw kerf at the two marks for the center. Then I drill a hole for the orlock shaft and I use a very shallow gouge to pare away the excess towards the ends. I cut the pad free from the stock and check my dimensions. Do some final fitting and repeat the process four more times. Now you will notice I was quite heavy handed with the saw kerf. Yes, I will fill those before painting. The orlocks are pretty easy to make. The method I've been using allows you to churn them out quickly and with a little practice pretty consistently. It goes like this. Take a piece of 26 gauge wire and stretch it out to straighten it as you saw me do earlier. And then I take a small length of it and in a pair of pliers, I put about four or five twists into it. I grab the wire at the top of the twist and tap it down on an anvil. The next thing to happen is easy to miss, but kind of important. Notice that Z shape in the two legs of the piece. We need to get rid of that, or at least mitigate it. And we can do that by squeezing the junction with pliers. But you have to be careful not to apply too much pressure. It's pretty easy to muscle right through that joint and break one of the legs off. You don't want to do that if you don't have to. Using a drill bit or a pin that's a bit larger than the diameter of the oars loom at the oar lock, because remember those oars do taper along the length of their loom. I bend the wire around it and I cut off most but not all of the excess. Grab the ends with pliers and bend it into the two guides that give it its characteristic shape. Next, the little loop at the bottom is cut off and then the two horns or guides are trimmed to their final length. With so much manhandling, 
it's easy to distort the piece. So a little tweaking and the piece is ready to be served. The method has the advantage of being fast and with a little bit of practice, easy to get consistent results, as I said before. The disadvantage is that it doesn't actually look like the real oarlocks. They were flat or a somewhat oval in section, not round, and the ends have a tapered radius. Now the second detail isn't too hard to address. The ends or the horns or guides or whatever you want to call it uh, can be flattened by squeezing them with a pair of pliers, as you saw me do earlier with the base. A quick touch with a sanding disc will impart the small taper. Now an unintended benefit of doing this is the transition between the round and the flat sections provides a convenient place for the serving to terminate. And speaking of serving, the oar locks were served to make them quieter when rowing onto a whale. There's nothing special about the way I do this. It's done by hand, and for small items like this, it doesn't take long at all. But, like most things, it does take a bit of practice to do a decent job. Uh, using the right size line is key here. At this scale, I need line about four thousandths of an inch. The only way I know to get line that fine without buying silkworm cocoons is to unstrand sewing thread. I untwist it and pull out one strand. You now have the option of using the single strand that you just pulled out or the two remaining strands. So you've basically doubled your chances of having the right size serving line. I give it a light coat of beeswax just so that it doesn't look so kinky and it also makes it a lot easier to handle. Now with something like the Orlox, I don't find it necessary to apply any adhesive to the Orlox itself to keep the serving in place during application. Just a touch of super glue at the top. And I also don't find I need to knot the line off. It adds too much bulk. I trim off the ends with a scalpel. And the last thing I do is singe off all those little fibers that you see sticking out. Got to be careful. This is definitely a high pucker operation. I was hoping to get to the spars and the sailing rig, but at nearly a half hour, I think there's probably enough here to digest for a while. In episode 11, we'll deal with the spar details and we'll also have a refresher course on making and installing silk span sails on the model. So if you're enjoying these videos, remember to hit all those buttons. You know the ones I mean. It helps others to find them. And do remember to share them with anyone you feel might like them too. So until I see you next time, remember to treat each other nicely. Now, break's over. Get back in the shop. Hi gang. I'll bet you thought you were done with me for the day. Not quite. It seems that I absentmindedly went through the whole editing process and realized at the end of it that I had forgotten to mention a couple of little things. Specifically three alternatives to using a rolling mill during that section of the video if you've seen it and I'm assuming that since you're at this part of the video you've seen it and wondering where were the alternatives? Here they are. First alternative. You can make the parts just the way you saw me making them in the first section of the video. That is, taking a piece of wire, bending it into a U-shape, hammering it out, putting the little curly cues on the end of it, and that whole thing. You can do it that way, and you'll get pretty good results if you practice a little bit. The second thing you can do, if you like building your own tools and you want to make your own custom made tools, you can actually make the rolling mill. It's not that difficult to do if you've got 
the proper machinery. And if you don't, you can always take the plans, and I'll tell you where to get the plans in just a moment, you can always take the plans to a machine shop, and they should have no problem fabricating this for you. I don't know how much it would cost. I have absolutely no idea, so I you know, don't know whether this is financially feasible for any anybody out there, or whether you're that motivated to do this. But in the Nautical Research Journal's Volume 1 of Ship Modeler's Shop Notes, on page 40, you'll find that someone wrote an article and he made all the technical drawings to make your own rolling mill. So that's alternative two. And alternative three is because at this scale you're working with fairly small pieces of brass flat stock or, or whatever you're working with, you can actually buy this flat stock at most hobby shops. Uh, K and S special shapes. Every hobby shop has them. Most most hardware stores have it, so you can even get it there. And the stuff is so small that you're dealing with at this scale that you can probably get away without having to anneal the piece to get it to bend around the mandrel. And even if you do have to anneal it, you can probably get away with doing it right at the kitchen stove. Or I'm sure that most people have. A propane torch and that would certainly be more than adequate for the job. Anyway, there are those three tips that I forgot to put in, those three alternatives. Aren't you glad you stuck around to the end?